I am a human being and I killed human beings. Before I knew it, I'd fired four shots at the door. I kept on shouting for Reva to phone the police. Tests are underway to determine if a serial killer is on the loose in Centurion, Pretoria. The dead won't bother you. It's the living you gotta worry about. In South Africa, 57 people are murdered every single day. These are the stories of the killers and the people who hunt them. I think society deserves to be protected from me and from others like me. A 15-year-old boy in a small country town in the Northern Cape is in the barn of his family home. Suddenly, he hears shots ring out. Afraid, he hides himself in the barn until the sound of gunfire seems to have passed. He leaves the barn and slowly approaches the house. He enters. There, he discovers two bodies, a 44-year-old man and his 43-year-old wife, the boy's mother and father. Then he discovers his 14-year-old sister, injured but still alive. He rushes to her side, attempting to lift her, but she dies in his arms, grabbing his T-shirt, tearing it as the life drains from her body. Realizing the threat could still be nearby, the boy rushes to warn farm workers. Upon reaching his vehicle, he hears a second round of shots. So he flees. At the gate to the farm, he discovers a cache of discarded weapons. He collects them and takes them to the police, reporting his family dead. In Krikwestad, only one of the Stienkamp family remain. But what really happened that night? My name is Paul Vivian Llewellyn. I'm a journalist curious about Africa's killers, criminals, and the cops who catch them. Joining me to discuss the reality behind crime on the continent is Jared Labaskachny, the former cop and current head of LNS Threat Management, who led the investigative psychology section of the South African Police Service from 2001 until 2016. And joining us today, his longtime colleague and partner in crime at LNS Threat Management, Bronwyn Stollars. Bronwyn is a clinical psychologist. She resigned from SAP's specialized investigative psychology section on the rank of colonel. In the IPS, she was the section commander of the forensic psychology subsection in charge of the forensic psychologists in the unit. She has worked on a wide range of psychologically motivated crimes, from single sexual murders to family murders to rape series. She worked on high profile cases such as the Oscar Pistorius case, the Van Breda family murders in Stellenbosch, and the case we will discuss today. Welcome, Bronwyn. Thank you. Over the course of the series, we're going to engage with more and more people on the show as we dig deep into the psychology that drives people to criminal behavior. Please visit our YouTube page and subscribe. For this series, we're keeping the podcast strictly audio, but in the near future, we will be filming the podcast. So make sure you know what's going down on our YouTube channel. We're available on iTunes and you can engage with us on our social media pages, Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is at Profiler Africa. And please join the group on Facebook. We're keen to hear your feedback, feel your questions and listen to suggested topics so please do get in touch remember that we will uh, post content on our social pages that relate to the crimes that we discuss so that you can better engage with the discussion and see what it is that we're talking about Bronwyn Gerard set the scene for us Hrikwestad the Northern Cape yeah well I think then as you as you may know the Northern Cape's a really big area um and very sparsely populated. And this is perhaps typical of some little farming community towns in that particular area, you know, very low crime rates. They don't have farm murders on a regular basis compared to other provinces. So really kind of like a, a sleepy hollow, you know, and like many of these places, the kids are in boarding schools often, you know, uh, and come home on weekends and holidays. Mm. Yeah, so really a town where I think everybody knows everybody and, and very importantly, this idea of, um, really not a lot of crime and really never having had any farm murders before, which became a big issue during this investigation and during the trial. Okay, tell us a little bit about the, the family in question, the Steenkamp family. 
So they were definitely a well-known and, and well-regarded family in their community. Um, Dion was a well-known farmer um, and, a, and a big contributor to their community. Christelle contributed um, very much at church. And the children themselves um, competed in gymkhanas, which are a type of um, horse activity that is very popular in that community. So this was really a family who was known by everyone and, and to a huge degree liked by everyone. Okay. And I think also what is very common in these cases it's a family where there was no real behavioral issues you know mm. the kids weren't in trouble at school on a regular basis mm. no things that would maybe say oh i can understand how we ended up with this murder taking place sure. mm. which is often what i think terrifies a lot of people so no behavioral problems and of course a very successful family very wealthy although if you went to their house they lived incredibly modestly let's talk about the the son the son in question mm. tell us a bit about about him he so Don, um, I think retrospectively, when we went to go and interview collaterals, so people in the community um, that were living around this income family and who knew them well, um, they, um, as Gerard had said, really no one could have said that they ever expected something like this to happen or could have foreseen it based on anyone in the, fa in the family's behavior. But retrospectively, when we look back and we interviewed people, there were concerns that there was an underlying um, envy and jealousy on Don's part, that his sister Martella was really described by everyone as the belle of the ball, a social butterfly, and her brother really struggled um, to keep up with that. Um, so there was definitely these themes of was there envy in their relationship, uh, okay. which again became a big issue during the trial. Okay, so... What were each of your first engagements with this case? Hmm. If I recall correctly, I think it was uh, Colonel Dick Duval came up to Pretoria. Uh, he's a very senior, very experienced investigator in the Northern Cape. And that's thing I must, must say about the Northern Cape. You know, they, they usually do big cases very well, and they have a lot of good, experienced investigators, and they take things, they take time to do things. And I think that was reflected in this case. And he contacted me saying, obviously, they just like our sort of more psychological input as to, you know, what do we think, uh, can we contribute? What do you think happened um, about family murder? Because again, these are not day-to-day -day crimes mm. that we've, you know, worked on quite a few, and Bronwyn's probably worked on, on, on the most of anybody in the unit over the years. Um, so insights into that, and of course, looking towards the trial, you know, what what do we think is going to play out? Where could we play a role in contributing? And there was, I think, from the start, an expectation that one of us uh, would, would end up testifying at the trial. But of course, waiting to have to see what the defense is going to bring from a psychological point of view sure. uh, in terms of their experts. Okay. So the, the incident happens. Police arrive on the scene. What do they, what do they discover? Yeah, well, I mean, as I said, it's, it's you know, uh, three dead. Um, yeah. So he, Don had gone to the police station and reported this. And of course, the police then went out to, to the venue um, and they find in, everybody inside the house mm -hmm. um, dead and, and appeared like they were all, you know, going to, you know, watching TV or sitting at the phone. Mm -hmm. no, no, no signs of a struggle, no signs that something had led up to this, uh, whether it had been argument between the parties or even people breaking in and them realizing and a bit of chaos in the inter, 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 interleading points mm -hmm. before they got shot. So shot and shot again. Yeah. So I think that was exactly the point that the family and it's very typical of family murder cases when we have a suspect who is a juvenile, that the family were seen to be at rest um, when they were killed. They were all in the living room area. There was definitely no signs of any sort of real struggle um, at the time that they were killed. So, yes. And, and as Gerald said, um, they were each shot um, with a two two rifle and then again uh, with a three point three six five revolver. And Dion Steenkamp and Martella both had significant blood and force trauma injuries um, to the back of the head. So I think that, you know, you've got three different types of weapon or th me mechanisms used, the blunt force, the two, two firearms, which again is a lot, it's overkill. I mean, what you see there, and often when we look at overkill, we kind of wonder what could have caused that increase in violence. And if there's nothing really, it almost shows us that the suspect wanted to exhibit so much violence. You know, if people start to get into a fight and the suspect has to try and dominate the victim, then you can see that there's an explanation for that escalation of violence because things got more chaotic, there's things knocked over, there's yeah. blood marks here and there. But this was almost that extreme violence that really had no, no need, you yeah. know, to, to engage in that level of violence towards these people because they were literally sitting down going about their daily business. One thing that I definitely recall about the case that struck me was everyone, and I really only got involved after the judgment and, and towards sentencing, was 
everyone's report of their initial feeling that how can this have happened in our community? How can there have been a farm murder in our community? There was almost no indications early on that anyone thought it was Don. Yeah. Um, and really, um, as Gerard said, um, Brig Duval actually really did a thorough investigation in terms of this mm. being a farm murder because yeah. they couldn't c bring their minds to the belief that mm. a young man from their community could have possibly committed mm. an offence like mm. that. And I think it also explains why they reached out to the unit mm. early on to kind of say, well, this is where the investigation is taking us. This is now looking like our main suspect. Can you mm. help us understand how this happens? Were there clear differences between between this crime scene and a typical farm murder scene? Well, I think perhaps the most important one was that there's nothing taken. You know, mm. farm murders, even if they have a history between the, the, the suspect and the family, maybe an ex-employer, um, which can sometimes explain why there's a bit of brutality in the murders. Mm. Um, You've not taken anything. You've not taken a bucky. You've not taken money. You've the firearms are mm. left at the front gate. So it's not as if they didn't couldn't get the safe open. They couldn't mm. find them. They had firearms and they leave them. And those are kind of the typical things. You know, vehicles, firearms, money, small items that you know um, suspects would often take in a farm attack. So again, it's a robbery, but. You, mm -hmm. you haven't succeeded in your motive, but there was no reason for you to flee. I mean, you're at a yeah. farm, there's, there's big distances. And the, yeah. only, the only thing that um, Don really reiterated throughout the trial was that there was money in the safe. There had been money in the safe and the suspects must have taken the money because the money was no longer in the safe. But there was absolutely no, no evidence to show that there was ever money in the okay. safe, that, that that really looked like um, an add-on from Don's point of view. Okay, so we've got an an affluent family living on a lovely farm with no history of, of any major kind of family trauma or incidents with the children play, acting out or anything mm -hmm. like that. You've got a crime scene where there's no sign of any breaking or entering, nothing's taken, mm -hmm. and you've got a boy with a story to tell. Mm -hmm. what, were the, what were the most important pieces of evidence initially um, that were identified? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it was basically that nothing was substantiating his story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think then they started to look very cool correctly Bron the 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 gunshots one of the gunshots that had hit this this the the, the shed mm -hmm. sliding door um, in the order of events could it couldn't have been in that position according mm -hmm. to the way Don described what he said happened sure. initially yeah but I think also perhaps what triggered Pep a little bit of concern is that if I, and Bron you can tell me if I, if I got this right is that the, the time of the when he went to the police he wasn't really behaving like a traumatized person. Now, we usually are kind of give a bit of leeway in terms of people's reactions to trauma. Yeah. Um, so often, you know, we do find people just go into a numbness. Yeah. But of course, later on, as more and more things come out, you kind of look at that behavior back again, saying, well, maybe that was a sign that this yeah. kid did this and had no emotions about it, etc. That's exactly right. I think you picked up on it just now. There was this idea of very soon after Don started to tell his version of events, um, Brig Duval and the crime scene guys started to look at, well, what is, how does his version of events fit into what we were seeing on the crime scene? And, yeah. and they just couldn't fit in this idea of farm murderers who had walked 10 kilometers from town to the farm, no signs of a vehicle that mm. they had used, that they'd left the firearms behind. And that when they asked on to explain his behavior on the crime scene in relation to the timeline that they had um, because they had a message from um, Christelle's, uh, sorry, yeah, Christelle Steenkamp to her sister um, was actually about just less than 10 minutes, I think it was, from the time she sent that message to the time Don got to town, um, to the police station. So it gave Don a very small window of time to commit the offenses. Yeah. And what was really Im important and instrumental during the trial was to show that Don's version could never have fit the timeline okay. that they got. Still to come, we reveal the uh, tragic details behind the Hrikostad murders, and later we try to understand what pushes people to commit acts that most of us just can't even imagine, that seem to be anti our programming as human beings. The killing of your own family. Tell your friends to catch us on brandlive.co.za or search Profiler Africa on YouTube, and please subscribe, 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 subscribe to our page, please. Um, we're also available on iTunes, and you can also follow us on Instagram or Twitter at Profiler Africa and join our Facebook group, please.
In South Africa, 57 people are murdered every day. On Profiler, we bring you the stories of the criminals and the people who hunt them. I am Paul Llewellyn. I'm a journalist curious to reveal the stories behind serious crime on the continent. Joining me is Jared Labaskakni, former head of SAP's investigative psychology section, and our guest, Bronwyn Stollars, a clinical psychologist and former section commander of the forensic psychology subsection in charge of the forensic psychologists at SAP's. Okay, tell us the story of what, what really happened that night. So obviously, this is the... Saps's crime scene, the narrative that we think must have happened, because of, of course Don has never told us exactly how things happened on the scene that day. Okay. So from the reconstruction of events and the evidence that was led in court, it's believed that um, Martella and her father were sitting on the couch in the living room and their mother was sitting in front of the computer, also in the living room. Don got up at some stage, went through to the main bedroom where their safe was kept. The safe was frequently open because they lived on a farm. I think it was something that um, was sort of standard. He, he took the .365 revolver okay. out of the safe took the cover off it, threw the cover on the floor, walked down the passage into the living room. And when he got there, he shot his mom first in the back, a single shot that hit her in the lower back as she was sitting at the computer. We think that very quickly after that, Dion and Martella stood up. He fired a shot at Martella and it hit her, I think just left of the, just on the side of the, her left breast and exited out the side of her chest and um, perforated the wall of the house. And that's the shot that hit the barn wall um, okay. outside their home. Um, I think very close in sequence to that, he, Dion stood up from the couch and he was a big guy um, and sort of charged at Don. As he was in motion, Don fired two shots at Dion. Um, and the, the crime scene guys actually explained sort of Dion's body position in relation to Don at the time that he shot him. Dion then kind of skidded across the kitchen floor and um, stopped at rest at their dining room table. Um, were there any accounts of any issues in the family in the, on that day or any family members or friends Nothing, no okay. stresses that were known to... So it really was kind of totally out of the blue. To us, I think so. Yes, we yeah. don't, well, not for Don. Yeah, yeah course, for Don, I definitely think there was there was premeditation in yeah. the sense that he knew what he wanted to do. Sure. Um, but to outsiders, I don't think there were any warning signs or indicators of okay. concern. Hmm. So but father... Even the, even, the, even the sort of jealousy issues, I mean, that yeah. that's not so uncommon in a lot of families that, you know, what one child feels that the other child has been given an unfair advantage, it might be rightly or wrongly so. Yeah. I mean, you don't automatically assume, oh, well, we're going to end up with the family murder because of that. So yeah. even retrospectively, you know, those things are interesting. Yeah. In Don's mind, that could be the main reason for him, but yeah. it might not make sense to us. Yeah. But again, nothing, nothing that really kind of would actually trigger your concern. Let's talk about the relationship with his sister and the, the sexual component. Again, um, during the trial, I think that became an issue because of the really serious injuries that we saw in Martella. So mm. that right, that initial sort of crime scene behavior wasn't the end of the scene. And Martella yeah. actually didn't collapse on the scene and she fled the scene, ran outside okay. um, and actually collapsed outside. So we think at that point, Don ran after her and they had a very serious physical altercation outside. Okay. He then hit her a couple of times with the firearm. Um, he had fired another shot at her as she was running outside. We believe that he then left her outside, mm -hmm. came inside and hit his father over the head as well with the 365. Okay. Um, then at some point, Martella got up and came back inside. And that's when she tried to phone for help Okay. Um, because her blood and her handprint were on the telephone. Sure. At that point, we presume that Don came back into the room with the .22 rifle and shot each of them in the back of the heads with the .22, which was really the execution okay. um, of these people. And, and the judge really looked at that, at this hugely long interaction that Don had with Martella and in light of the the sexual assaults and the sexual injuries or they'd say the sexual injuries that she had um he he believed that that was a very big motivator for the incident okay. that Don was jealous of her that he had been forcing some sort of sexual interaction on her which was penetrative in nature okay and that she had threatened to tell her parents and that that must have come about close okay. to her on the day. But there's no indication of how long this was going on with them. What was he like? 
Don? To us or to to other people? To um, yeah, well, okay. okay. Well, I think we got a sense that, I mean, the community and friends mm. didn't pick up on any kind of particularly mm. odd behaviours or anything like uh, that. So school, to you guys, what was your guys' assessment I mean, of him? Bron, mm. Yeah, Bron actually got the opportunity to, do, to try and assess him. So Yeah, I think that he was a very... He was described by his peers and by his teachers and, and the people in the community, as I said, as this really quite a quiet guy who didn't have a lot of friends, but there were no overt signs. So he wasn't aggressive. He wasn't using foul language. He wasn't getting into trouble. Um, I think that after the murders, his behavior definitely at school changed and his behavior towards um, the police that were involved in his case was of concern. So at school, there were incidents where he would become disruptive in class, where he wouldn't listen to teachers any longer. Um, and he started to ask quite concerning questions about what his inheritance would be like okay. very, very shortly mm -hmm. after the murders. And also lying about how much pocket money he used to get and then insisting yeah. that he gets X amount, which is actually more than he used to get. And so, yeah. so little okay. things that you kind of wonder, hey, why is that this, Why is that important to you? Your parents have just been killed allegedly by you, according mm -hmm. to someone else, uh, allegedly according to you by someone else. Yeah. Um, yet that was important to you. Mm -hmm. You want this much pocket money. What's going to happen with this item in the house? And mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's as almost he was more yeah. focused on mm -hmm. he's going to become this yeah. rich inheritor. Yeah. Yes, and he, and he would make odd statements like, we'll sell everything in the house. I don't want anything. Just get as much money for it as you can. No sentimental value attached okay. to anything. He wanted to take his sister's horse to a gymkhana, you know, sort of a week after the murders. Okay. So those were kind of telltale concerning signs. On interview and on interaction with the police, he was, and, and towards me as well, very calm, um polite. I found him on interview to be quite manipulative. He would avoid okay. um, answering questions by deferring the, the, the question to me. So he would say things like, no, but Tani must tell me what I must say. Um, so that is quite manipulative. He knew mm. why he was being interviewed. He'd already been found guilty of this yeah. horrific crime. Um, so we, we very quickly after the crime started to see very manipulative behavior on his part. Did you get a sense that he didn't understand the, the <clears throat> weight of his situation or the, the, the you know what I mean? I think if you, if you look at an emotional level, yeah. I think a lot of, from, as I said, from the crime scene and then throughout the trial, he just wasn't behaving like someone you would imagine where they would behave. Either yeah. a person who's lost to the whole family on his version of events by someone else. Yeah. Um, or that, you know, even if he did it himself, that doesn't mean that one might not still express some sense of remorse or, or not even express it, but show it in your, in your facial expressions and in your mm. demeanor and your posture. Mm. And that was just never there. Yeah. And I also think it's something that we do see with juveniles who commit these types of crimes. There is the sense of almost um, a night very much adolescent-like naivety and arrogance mm. about the way that they explain their crimes. And that was what we saw with Don. I mean, every time new evidence came to light or he had to explain something about what had happened, he would change and adapt his version to okay. account for that new evidence or to account for the questions that were being asked of him, which is a very juvenile way yeah. of trying to explain your behavior. So I think it's a, actually a bit of both. Mm. I think he was very manipulative because he was misleading. And I mean, he was found guilty um, of defeating the ends of justice mm. because of this attempt to mislead the okay. police. Let's just conclude the case how does he how do we get to, 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 to arresting him and then just talk us briefly through the the process of you know in court and what have you so obviously you, you never want to arrest like quickly in these cases there's also no need to arrest quickly you know it's not a person who we think is going to go out and kill another family in another family <clears throat> you have a minor person which you never want to willy-nilly just arrest anyway so I think they played it very cautiously yeah. um, and in and, and the right way to investigate every possible angle, every possible twist, every possible version that could possibly be raised by the defense was explored and ruled out forensically. Yeah. And of course, in the end, this was really was a circumstantial evidence trial. Mm. You know, nobody saw him do it. Yeah. You know, we didn't have anything direct on him. He, I think he did say that even he fired a shot with the firearm that he picked up at the front gate, didn't he? No, he said he'd been shooting meerkat in oh, the okay. morning and that explained. Could explain yeah. why he has gunshot residue on his hand. So it was all going to hinge on... And that on, is pretty typical in that yeah, kind of community. Yes, no, exactly. It's all going to hinge on circumstantial evidence, which is ultimately what is... It's not a weaker evidence, but you just have to have an accumulation of it yes. to, to really you know, win your case. And it's still, it's not a guaranteed win yeah. in the end. So I think the prosecution team really was brave, um, very good, 
and worked fantastically well with the, with the, with the police team to, to get the result they got. Explain that, that timeline, how the timeline didn't coincide. Um, in terms of the crime scene? Yes. yes. So Don's version of events was that, uh, that he gave the police, which he then adapted over time based, as Gerard has already said, on things like gunshot residue being taken from his hands, et cetera, et cetera. His timeline, very roughly, was that he was busy fixing something in the storeroom when he heard a round of shots in the house. He went running inside. When he came inside, um, Martella was still alive. Um, his mom and his dad were deceased. He held her. She told him that she loves him. In her final moments, she he, she was clutching onto his shirt. He sort of pushed her away because he said um, her blood made him chachrol. He sure. didn't like it, so he pushed. Yeah. yeah, so he pushed her away from him. That tore his shirt. He then, um, what we know from the scene, he changed his shirt, and then yeah. he says he ran back outside, got in the vehicle, and drove into town. What then happened was the questions around, but why didn't you hear the two two shots? Because they were all shot with the three six five and with the two two. Then he said, Oh, actually what had happened is I went back to the storeroom to get into the car and while I was in the storeroom I heard the second round of shots. Then I got in the car and drove out. By that time the suspects would have already have fled and left the guns by the gate. So that was a concern. Second concern was that the police were saying, but what it meant was that the suspects were still inside the house when you first mm. came in to check in on, um, on the deceased. And why wouldn't they have killed you? Yeah. They would have had no reason not to kill Don as well. Um, so his timeline, by his version, would have taken much longer because he described hiding in the storeroom mm. as he heard the shots, hiding again and waiting for it to be quiet when he heard the second round of, sh of shots before he got into the bucky. And as I said, what gave the police a very good timeline um, that was uh, Colonel Moller's evidence, who was our cell phone expert, was that from that SMS that was in a conversation between Christelle and her sister mm. was sent, I think it was even less than 10 minutes, it was sort of nine minutes and some change, sure. okay. calculated with the amount of time it would have taken him to drive into mm. town, left absolutely no time mm. for, for him to have hidden the way that he said he did, come into the house, check on everyone, have this interaction with Martella, um, and then flee. Mm. So this uh, whole incident happened in a matter of minutes. Yes, mm. very quickly. And he immediately fled the scene and headed into town to the police station to and, report. And that was a big problem for the judge as well. He was saying, but if you came into the house and you saw everybody was injured, yeah. first you change your shirt, then you get in the car and you rush to town. Whereas your sister in her dying moments from the blood spatter, they could see that she had actually, although she was mortally wounded, had gone to check on her dad. They were, her blood spatter was on her dad. She'd then gone to her mom, checked on her mom, gone to the counter, picked up the phone to call mm. for help. And the judge reiterated, but why didn't you just pick up the phone and ask for help or use the farm mm. radio to yeah. call for help? And of course, psychologically, I think he just didn't want to be on the scene anymore. Mm. Um, still to come, we get an insight into the psychology behind family murder and what this case reveals about the things that drive people to commit these crimes. Tell your friends to catch us on brandlive.co.za or search Profiler Africa on YouTube and please subscribe to our page. We're also available on iTunes and you can also follow us on Instagram or Twitter at Profiler Africa and uh, join our Facebook group, please. In South Africa, 57 people are murdered every day. On Profiler, we bring you the stories of the criminals and the people who hunt them. Okay, so we've discussed the Krikwestad case. Don did it. Let's talk about the psychology now. So, in general, when an individual kills members of their family, the broad and umbrella term we use is a familicide. It's more unusual when we see offspring or a child, whether that child is legally still a juvenile or whether they're in their 20s or 30s as an adult, kills their parents um, and is normally a sibling as well. Um, that we refer to as a parasite or a parasite siblicide. Okay. That 
terminology can be broken down further to a maternal parasite if you only kill your mom, paternal parasite you only kill your dad, or a siblicide only killing um, your sibling. But what we're seeing in family murders, particularly in South Africa, are really mass events where these individuals are killing both their mother, their father, sometimes because of our family structure in South Africa, a granny um, or a step parent, and then siblings or step siblings. Um, it's still, I think, in any country going to be a rare event. You know, it's mm. what yeah. they call a black swan event. Um, low frequency, but with a high impact. And I think even if we took all the ones we've had in the past hundred years and studied each one of them in detail, I still wonder whether we would get answers to why did this person, I mean, there are general categories and typologies which, which Bron can go into, mm. but it's still such a rare thing that I think it's a lot of it's misunderstood or not understood yet. Because we haven't got any, um, what we call longitudinal studies on family murders just yet, we don't know how violent these people will be over time because we have such a small sample size. And I think initially when I started on the Quick with Start case, I consulted with one of our international colleagues to say, you know, how often are you seeing these kinds of cases and how should we, you know, we be thinking about them? And he was like, oh, you'll probably never get another one, you know, um, during your career. It's quite unlikely. And I mean, just in five years at SAPS, okay. I had three family murder cases wow. committed by offspring. So okay. it's it's actually, when you're talking three and five years, it's that's just that we worked on. There yeah. might have been mm -hmm. many more. Yeah. So we th we do think it's it's rarer than other types of crime, but we are seeing it. Um, yeah. So it, it should be a concern. So Don Steenkamp to this day has not taken accountability for it and in and not really revealed no. his true motives. What are your insights into what? his potential motives? So although I think motive, Gerald, I will be, be able to explain it a bit better, but motive is very difficult often to understand when the suspects themselves don't really have a good grasp of why they have committed a particular type of offense. Yeah. So then we do look at, at crime classification and what is the research telling us? And in, in parasite cases, one particular researcher, um, Kathleen Hyde, tried to say, okay, well, let's break these down into mm -hmm. subgroups to look at what sort of children, be them juvenile or adults, um, kill their parents. And she said, one, the severely abused offender. So this is your, your child who endures severe, severe psychological and emotional yeah. and sometimes sexual abuse at the hands of a parent or both parents. And they kill their parents um, or this individual as the only means of escaping the cycle of abuse. Okay. Um, so the second category she then talked about is a child who's severely mentally ill. So your child who has or young adult who has a delusional belief, for example, that mom is poisoning his food and he kills mom in line with this delusional belief, this psychosis that they have, mm. which is really, I think, probably quite rare. Um, and then the third one that she talked about, the third category, she talked about the dangerously antisocial offender. So psychologically, we have a diagnosis for people of antisocial personality disorder, but that's not what Hyde is talking about. She's talking about the suspect that kills their families for purely selfish reasons, so for personal gain. Okay. And very, very frequently we look at, and definitely the cases we've seen in South Africa, the majority of those have been an individual who kills their parents, one, because they feel like their parents were too strict too constrictive, won't allow them to become what they want to do, doesn't spend the money on them that they would like them to spend, um, perhaps quite a punitive discipline style um, with these types of children and really sometimes an inheritance involved. But the umbrella of the, is this idea of this child who kills because I don't like the way that you are treating me and I want to do things my way. So f from, my, from my interview with Don, Don and, and having interviewed collaterals and, and looked at the case, I definitely felt that Don fell into the antisocial okay. um, classification mm -hmm. because I felt like he had killed for selfish reasons. He okay. wanted his parents to spend more money on him. Um, he wanted nicer things. He wanted to inherit the farm so that he could do what he wanted with the farms. He wanted to sell off one of the farms, um, bring in different types of cattle. He had very big plans. Um, and I do think that although there was nothing wrong with the family system, there may have been quite a patriarchal structure to their mm. family, which Don didn't like. And I think okay. you know you just can't overlook the fact that the Van Bredaar family and the in, in the Steenkamp case, these there was a lot of money to play. And we're not talking about life insurance policy. We're talking about the family had a lot of money, yeah. even more so in the Van Bredaar case, besides mm. any life insurance. And you just can't 
They know that yeah. um, in these particular cases. So the way he acted towards his sister is really just, you know, he's li- felt like he's lived in a shadow and he's going to get what he wants and he's going to commit this one act, this act of ex- ex- especially violent yeah. act towards his sister. So I think the, the, the sexual violence towards Martella is, is not understood by is not well understood by all of us who okay. were involved in, in this case in terms of how it fit in. The injuries to Martello, we think, were some of them indicated that they had healed and then be re, been re-injured. Okay. So it wasn't as though she was injured on the day of the offence um, with regards to the sexual injuries themselves. So there was this, they, we did hypothesise, um, and definitely, as I said, that was the judge's thinking, that Don was jealous of of Martella, that there was an ownership. Remember, sexual assaults and sexual interactions when they are not consensual are very much about power. Um, Was he exerting his dominance and control over her in some way? Mm. Um, And had she now threatened to tell her parents? Or um, had there been some sort of an inappropriate relationship between them that was consensual? But I think that that was definitely not the judge's feeling, that that he had forced himself on her on numerous occasions. Okay. Um, What was the sentence? So for juvenile offenders in South Africa, um, the court proceedings and the trial are very interesting because in South Africa, even when you are um, being tried for a very serious offence, the Child Justice Act and the Children's Act really look after children, um, even during their trials. And the same applies at sentencing. So in South Africa, a child cannot be given a life sentence. Um, Don was given the, what we would really consider, I think now the standard sentence for juvenile um, parasite offenders in South Africa um, of 20 years for each of the murder, which okay. he serves concurrently. Okay. Do these kinds of offenders go on to harm people when they, if they're released from prison, typically? So there's, we have one South African gentleman um, who killed his family in Durban, and he was sentenced, I think, to 20 years. He served about nine years of his sentence, was released, um, got married. Um, upon being released and about three years after he was released from from prison he stabbed his wife to death so we have one other parasite offender who was a juvenile at the time that he killed his family and he has been released on parole and we've never heard or seen from him in terms Mm. of a criminal offense again so he has just gone on for all appearances sake to to carry on with his life so We don't have enough data, but Mm. I definitely think our risk assessment of these types of individuals is to say that if they are killing for these selfish reasons, um, we are very concerned about um, a potential risk for violence, but in relation to family members or people with whom they already Mm. have an emotional attachment. Mm. And, you know, there probably should be a couple that are coming up for parole soon. I think the the Lotter family murder in Durban. Raven okay. Stein has uh, just gone through parole. Just, uh, you know, Nicolette Lotter and Ardis Lotter, they, they, they probably would be coming up for a parole consideration. So although you're sentenced 20 years, I think in, in, it's either a half or two thirds, you can be considered mm. for parole. And then every two years thereafter, you will have another parole review. Okay. So, um, but that's also a problem because with these juvenile offenders who are killing people when they're 14, 15 years old, they are released at a young age. Yeah. They have mm. their whole lives ahead mm. of them. Yeah. And, you know, and, and when you're institutionalized, this is, I mean, we're starting to see it much more globally that this is not necessarily the best path to rehabilitation. Yeah. And of course, yeah. in their normal life, they weren't behaving badly. So yeah. they're probably not going to necessarily behave badly in the prison environment, which is a very strict, rigid, controlled environment. So mm-hmm. that's not a really good proof that, oh, well, they've done well in the past 12 years in prison. They haven't gotten into any trouble. Well, that's a good sign. We should let them go. We, we're also not quite sure even how to risk assess these guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they're an enigma. How, how then are we, how then do we continue to study? Do we continue to study these mm-hmm. types of crimes and how do we actively study them currently in South Africa? I don't know if anybody's really studying them. Um, you know, I think okay. there, there has been one PhD study um, done by a lady from University of Pretoria okay. who looked at um, only at juvenile offenders. And that's something else in terms of the research. We have to look at juvenile offenders versus mm. individuals who kill their parents as adults um, as potentially separate groups. Mm. So we, I think there needs to be more published data, um, particularly yeah. after parole, on, on what these gents are getting up to. So typically our understanding of these types of crimes 
moves forward when another one of these types of crimes occurs. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, okay. yes. Um, for, for you, for each of you individually, what was the big takeout from this case for each of you? I think for me, and it might not be what people expect. You know, I just think how, from the investigation point of view, you have to, if you walked onto this crime scene, only thinking this is a family, a, a, a farm murder, and you didn't document everything to the T. It would have been very difficult later to start to prove that Don's story isn't isn't good. And they had the provincial crime team team that went out. Okay. Dick Duval, as I said, was an experienced violent crime investigator, uh, a senior member in in the, in the province in terms of police investigations. They had a good team of people assisting him. You know, again, if you do a proper job from the start, you'll gather what those little minutia of details that later become that circumstantial evidence that breaks you know that breaks the camel's back to get a conviction. Yeah. And that was done fantastically well from the start by SAPS, and it paid off later on. And to have very competent, ballsy prosecutors that just worked very well um, and exploring all the avenues, taking it carefully. You know, this had just landed up and being left at the local police station to deal with. We, I don't think we would have had the outcome that we that we saw. I just think I'm going to go with the, the Gurlia answer to this one. I think that you do lots and lots and lots of cases of varying degrees, crimes against children, sexual crimes. And we all have those, those ones that we take home with us mm. um, or aspects of those crimes that we take home with us that just don't sit well or don't feel well. And I think the thing that's really stayed with me after this trial was... I mean, I mean, I remember sitting at sentencing, Martella had um, her school principal um, who testified and a couple of people who testified about her as an individual. And just, I mean, watching people in court um, being so emotional at the loss of this beautiful, talented, vivacious young woman who had her whole life ahead of her and how emotional everybody was about that. And I think for me to look at it and say, you know, even for Don, that this is what he has done is, is truly the most atrocious crime. But he also had a wonderful life ahead of him and he faces a hugely long sentence in prison. And I think it was really my first case of, of looking at a juvenile and saying, but now what is next for you? Yeah. Um, the loss is huge, but the loss for these suspects is also huge. Yeah. That thought that there might be somebody living under your roof, a child, yeah. a sibling, and you know, you do everything you, everything you need to do to protect yourself, but unbeknownst to you, there's a, there's a lurking threat within the household. I mean, it is, it goes so deep down to, you know, it's, mm. it strikes us, so, uh, it strikes deeper than, you know, a psychopathic killer that's mm. on a killing rampage and is doing it for sexually motivated mm. power reasons. Mm. Here you've got something out of the blue in a household environment. Mm. And that's got to be, and that is a, a terrifying prospect. And, uh, and I think definitely lots of people have said that to us after the fact in these cases to be like, but, but how were people supposed to know that he was going to do this? How could exactly. his family have ever done anything to prevent this? No one could have done anything mm. to prevent these. Exactly. I've been stopping myself from asking you. I've got a three-year-old who I know is an absolute narcissist. I think all three-year-olds <laughs> are narcissists. When I was a younger, when I was, when I was growing up, I had a brother that, that took great mm. glee in making my life a misery. Mm. But how do you know when he's going to take that kind of next step. noogies in the corner yeah. to the next step and, you mm. know, come and get And I think, it. again, just, this is the aspect of some psychologically motivated crimes that just drive fear into us. It's the it's the pedophile priest who you would never have thought would do something like this. It's a yeah. serial murderer who works next door and was a friendly Married, neighbor. Yeah. It's the, and this is another, the epitome perhaps of it, of the, the you know, the, the context where you'd never expect it to happen, A, because it's a child towards, yeah. a, you know, in the family context of that sense and with no behavioral problems. And it's these ones where people just really struggle to wrap their heads around. Bronwyn, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks Gerard, as always. My pleasure. Fantastic spending time with you. On the next episode, we will discuss the epidemic of sexual abuse and rape as we meet the birthday rapist. Tell your friends to catch us on brandlive.co.za every Thursday. The show premieres at 12 p.m. on Brand Live every week. So be there for that if you want to be the first to catch each of our new episodes. Please search Profiler Africa on YouTube and please subscribe, subscribe, subscribe to our page. We're also available on iTunes and you can also follow us on Instagram or Twitter at Profiler Africa is our handle. And please join our Facebook group. Thanks for listening and pleasant dreams. Thank you.